Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn from Focus Compounding on air live with the co-host of the Focus Compounding podcast, Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you're tuning in with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check out all of our content uh, that we put out there on the internet. The best place to get everything that we push out into the world is to follow me on Twitter at, at Focus Compound. Of course, all the information is down in the description below. You could go to focuscompounding.com to get free investment write-ups, uh, investment topic write-ups, just overall blog posts going all the way back to 2005 from Jeff uh, by going to focuscompounding.com. And of course, if you're interested in learning about our money management services, reach out to me at andrew focuscompounding.com. Let's start the conversation. So Jeff, I was just telling you and I was like, wait, we should stop talking. We like to keep it, mm -hmm. you know, all real here. Let's hit the record button and talk about this. It's 11 a.m. right now. We normally record at 3.30. And I got to say, I'm like three espressos in, <laughs> haven't had any food yet. So I'm still fasting. I've gone on a, a, on a walk, you know, just get the brain mm -hmm. going, get the, the brain pumping. I have a Celsius that I've yet to open up right next to me. Of course, the best flavor, sparkling orange. And I feel amazing. And it's 11 a.m. So I feel much better <laughs> recording at 11 a.m. instead of 3.30. So perhaps we could start recording at 11 a.m. That's how mm -hmm. I'm feeling. How are you feeling? Yeah, it's fine with me. Fine with you? <laughs> yeah. Do you have a preference? I have a coffee right here. I have there a coffee go. right here. Very good. Very good. Well, um, what are we talking about today? I don't even know. March 1st, we could get right into it um uh, did you have a chance to check out the buffett letter i did i read the buffett letter yeah you did did you print it out or did you read it on your computer screen yes i have it uh right here there the right camera. there that's just so what it just they say the back of the pages so not with a lot of evidence but yeah that's the letter okay so did you print the whole annual report or did you just print out the letter no. Nope, just the letter for this uh, podcast, because I figured we'd probably go over the letter. People would ask about the letter, but not the entire annual report. Uh-huh. So I guess before we, you know, go through it and go over our thoughts, what are your just initial thoughts about the letter? This is probably our third or fourth, I guess probably fifth year of doing this, going over the letter. Uh, right. So what are your general thoughts before we jump into it? Well, I thought it was very short Very. i thought it wouldn't tell many uh, anyone much about berkshire if they didn't know about berkshire and this was the letter that they were looking at to decide on making the investment um i also thought it was very good in some of the things it said especially you know something that we've talked about a little bit and i think charlie munger has talked about more uh buffett goes into talking about how he's actually only made about one truly good decision every five years or so at berkshire yeah. Um, about 12 of them. And also how he's made a lot of mistakes, but because the con that, you know, the mistakes compound at a low rate and the successes compound at a high rate, they become a very small part of Berkshire. Uh, so I thought that was all actually very good and very helpful in understanding the record. And he did talk a little bit about some other things like saying how the media doesn't cover the stock correctly and to ignore operating earnings. And he also talked about float and it, talked about making sure that people go and read a description of float so if they did all of that then i think they would learn a lot about berkshire compared to what things the media gets wrong mm -hmm. dude i thought i mean apparently he listens to podcasts so i'm just going to go on a <laughs> limb and say he listens okay. to the focus compounding podcast <laughs> and when he was to your point right and i have this because i thought it was one of the most important uh sentences or, or or paragraphs in the letter so i highlighted it in blue when he says a lesson for investors, the weeds wither away in significance as the flowers bloom. Over time, it takes just a few winners 
to work wonders. And yes, it helps to start early and live into your 90s as well. And then how he was talking about, yeah, the once every five years, he's come up with like these big, great decisions. But it reminded me of how you had said you would manage your personal portfolio and advice you would give to other individuals where you come up with perhaps one idea per year, you don't mm -hmm. sell. And then over time, assuming you are good at this, the winners should just take, uh, you know, uh, should become a huge part of the portfolio. And then the losers just become minuscule uh, compared to the rest of the portfolio over time. Yeah. And that works for Berkshire because they have earnings and they have float and that would work for individuals if they're saving. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's where we talk about the difference between like a portfolio idea, which is usually how people talk about like how much should I have in this or something and the reality of how you're going to save, which is usually that, you know, when you're 20 something years old, you could put a hundred percent into something because at that point you've managed to save almost nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. But your savings in future years are going to be a lot larger than they were initially. And it's the same sort of thing at Berkshire, you know, he talks about how float increased 8,000%. I mean, 8,000 times, sorry. Yeah. And um, so, of course, the same thing wouldn't work out if he had a limited pool of capital and nothing more came in, right? So, like, if he kept the textile mill open for 20 years longer than it should have been open, uh, but he'd been dealing with, like, a portfolio that you would get because uh, you inherited something and you never saved money again. This is for more flows of money coming in each year. But that's how most people are saving and mm -hmm. investing. And it's how Berkshire does it. It's how most companies work. You don't just have a pot of money that you get one time to deal with and you have to sell to buy something else. You get more flows coming in over time. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of fund managers that listen to the podcast. How do you think they should think about it in the context of perhaps they're continuously getting inflows, hopefully, from investors as well yeah. and how you would think about that? Yeah, I mean, that's the problem. The, um, ben Graham made a, a bit more than half of his money, made most of his money from his Geico position because he agreed to buy Geico for the fund. It was distributed, and he took his distribution of it, and he never sold it. He just viewed it as a different kind of stock, didn't sell it, right? So he actually made more money from that than he did from managing money that way. Uh, Bill Miller, right, invested in Amazon, and so with the fund and everything, has always held it but it's trimmed it back to whatever 5% or whatever the, the normal thing for a mutual fund would be. So it made a lot of money over it over time. But of course, if it just had held it since, you know, first buying it, it would be doing much better than if he, you know, did all the decisions that he did since then. So the problem is a lot of this can't be applied that well to the approaches that, that um, money managers have, right? Cause it's not what people are looking for that way. Um, so, I don't know the answer to that, except, you know, it's difficult. Sequoia, over the years, um, had Berkshire, you know, and trimmed it back and everything. So it can still contribute a lot to your results, but it's not going to have the same, it's not going to have the same um, sort of uh, contribution over time that way. Um, Buffett also talks about how the rest of those decisions were, you know, um, on average didn't add or detract that much, right? So that is one thing to keep in mind is that, like, churning the, Turning the smaller parts of, parts of the portfolio might not matter that much for um, fund managers to think about. So if you have, you know, say you have a fairly high level of concentration. So you have, you know, um, your top 10 stocks or something account for 50%, 70% or whatever of your portfolio. What you're doing in the other part is probably churning it even faster than the part that you have the bigger positions in. And it probably is one, the ideas aren't particularly good or particularly bad you know, as Buffett's experience has been. And two, it's a smaller percentage in each of them. So it may be that the portion of your portfolio you're churning more is, you know, less important that way. And you're spending too much time thinking about that. Mm -hmm. And when he talks about the, you know, one idea every five years, right? I mean, this line right here, he, he reiterates how they are not stock pickers. They are business pickers. And I think when you think in the context of the portfolio and how he thinks about, well, you have this flow coming in and how over time your winners should um, make up for all of your losers. It's just an interesting framework that I think a lot of people don't, um, you know, sometimes think about. I mean, sometimes like I got flamed on Twitter because I was talking about how, and I knew this was going to upset a lot of people, but I was saying how you should approach from like a framework perspective, 
doing research mm -hmm. on a stock as if you're going to acquire the whole company. No, you're not ever going to get to go and sit in like a special office where they have all their financials with a bunch of lawyers and accountants and be able to go and do that level of due diligence. But basically what I was trying to say is I believe most investors, when they approach a company, they're truly thinking about it more so from like the numbers and how the numbers work and, and doing all this Excel monkey work and stuff like that, as opposed to thinking about, well, if I was going to purchase a whole company, guess what I would be thinking about? Who are your customers? Who are the competitors? And really thinking about like understanding the relationship from those two, you know, perspectives or whatever. Um, so I had said, you know, you should approach it as if you're going to acquire the whole company. Of course, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm under no illusion that you will never be able to do. They're not one in the same. However, I do think it's a good framework because I think it gets people away from thinking about just the numbers and really starts to uh, get people to think more so about like everything we talk about on the podcast, right? Like the competitive advantage, how durable is the business, but more so the customer and competitor decision making, because one of the best things we've ever said, and I think it's so true, is that you can't understand a business until you understand those two things, right? The decision making that customers and competitors both make. So when Charlie or when Warren and Charlie speak about not being stock pickers and how they're business pickers, they're not thinking of stocks like, oh, we have a 10% position in our portfolio and we should trim it back and we're managing this, you know, this beta and blah, 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 blah. It's really, they're investing in businesses, right? So what does that mean to you when they say, yep. we're not stock pickers, we're business pickers? Well, he kind of lays it out in different parts. He doesn't put it all in one spot. But basically what he says is Berkshire does two things differently when it takes a full position in when it buys an entire company instead of an individual stock. And those two things are uh, it controls capital allocation and it picks management. Mm -hmm. And so where you're saying, you know, people are, are saying um, it's not the same thing buying a stock versus buying the whole company. It's exactly the same thing except for two things. You don't get to select capital allocation, and you don't get to select the management. Now, in exchange for that, Buffett says, you can get a bargain price when buying pieces of a business. You'll never mm -hmm. get a bargain price buying the entire business. That is, I mean, they won't knowingly sell to you at a bargain price. They will knowingly sell a stock to you. I mean, we've had that happen, that people believe that they're selling you too cheaply, but they'll do it. But, but they're probably not going to do that except, as he says, except under duress if they control the company. So in exchange for getting a bargain price, you give up control of capital allocation and picking the management. So that's one reason why Berkshire focuses a lot on capital allocation and management when buying stocks, because then it doesn't matter as much that they don't have control of that, right? So like when they bought a piece of capital cities in the market, a small amount, and then they sold it later, um, just in the public markets, that really isn't different for them than when they got a uh, very influential purchase that would have given them a lot of control over Capital Cities ABC when they merged together because they didn't, they liked the management and would have wanted to keep it and they wouldn't have wanted capital allocation to be any different. So it's better for them just to buy as a passive buyer in those cases. So um, I think that that's the approach that we always use. Uh, certainly the approach that I always use is to the big mistakes have been not buying something because uh, buying some, not buying something that I certainly would have bought if I was offered the whole company. Right. So I've, we've talked about that before. Right. So like, that's why I say um, DreamWorks animation or something was a mistake because it's not that it went up all that much or whatever before being sold to someone else. But if they'd said, you can buy the whole company here, it is for this amount. I would have said, okay, I'll buy it. Um, as would have, you know, a lot of other studios and stuff. So that's buying the whole company. Um, the, the, a lot of people get caught up on the difference between the two, right? And mm -hmm. I'm not sure how big the difference is. It, it's difficult to calculate because for one thing, you don't know the way in which you'll get your return. So most people kind of assume uh, a continuation of the status quo sort of thing. So you look at a company and they always assume, oh, well, it'll stay public and it won't change its policies about dividends or whatever. It won't get bought out. Management won't offer to buy it out. Someone won't try to buy it out. Uh, people who are involved in it won't die, merge it together, whatever. Okay. But at some point they will and whatever gap there was will close you know, instantly at that time. So that's always one of the arguments. I've invested in companies where management controls all of the company. Um, I mean, I've invested in companies where management controls more than 90% of the shares, owns more than 90% of the shares. Um, and in cases where the company's gone private because management has taken them over, which has happened in a few cases, 
uh, you know, you've gotten well compensated. So eventually you've gotten a price that's closer to the fair price that you'd get. Um, sometimes management participates in buying out the company. Sometimes management has to be given different things on either side, whatever. Um, but you know, the, eventually the, the only way to think of the asset is what it's worth to people, you know, economically in general. And so if you get too far away from that, then you're thinking about like, well, what can they report in earnings or something? That doesn't matter. You know, that's why cash flow matters and those things, because these things matter, not because we say that they matter and it's magic that this works out this way, but because that could be used in some way by owners. It can be used to pay debts. It can be used. So, so it can be used to finance a deal. Mm -hmm. If something's strategically important in the industry, then it has value, even if it doesn't have value um, in terms of reporting earnings today. Right. So all of those things matter a lot. And I don't see any other way of doing it except asking what's the value to a private owner. I mean, that's also something that Buffett, Munger, others have talked about, that when they say here are the things about Ben Graham that are things that are true for now and true forever, the two that they really talk about are how to think about the market fluctuations. so the Mr. Market idea. Mm -hmm. um, they talk about margin of safety. But the other thing that they'll mention is the idea of the value to a private owner, thinking of a business. Uh, thinking of a stock as a business instead of thinking of it as a stock. That's the way Ben Graham thought about it, and that's the way Buffett and Munger think about it. And it's a different way of thinking in that Graham was thinking about what's the liquidation value. Um, but it's the same argument that people would say, well, what does net current asset value matter? Because they're not going to liquidate. But ultimately, the fact that they could liquidate, that that would be a better use of the company, means that you'll get a, a better return in from that. So that's why looking at the entire company, looking at the stock as, as if it's the company um, makes a lot of sense. And I don't see another way of doing it. I don't have a better method for how you would do it. That would make sense. Um, now over very short periods of time. Sure. Like, mm -hmm. you know, over one day, then if you're buying an option that expires at the end of the day, then you're just going to use um, zero uh, days to expiration, baby. <laughs> yeah. So you're just going to assume random movements. Right. Mm -hmm. But that, you know, um, but over longer periods of time that, you know, it's just common sense in terms of the business and how the business does. And that's all that's going to matter in the really long term. Are you generally pretty skeptical of management buyouts? Like in those situations, right? We talked a little bit about this last week, especially in net nets, how, well, they could buy out your net net for a hundred or 200% higher. And then you could still be mm -hmm. upset because you're like, well, it's actually probably still worth three or 400% higher. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm not as I'm, I'm not skeptical that they'll happen. I, I do believe that management will buy out their shareholders in a lot of cases, especially in places like the U.S. and stuff where it could be aggravating to be a public company. Um, yeah, I think that that, that happens a lot. I, I've been in situations where it's happened. Uh, yeah, you don't get as good a deal, sure, mm -hmm. um, because it's not being shopped around. Management can block it from being shopped around. But, you know, sometimes you get a pretty... Good deal. Um, so examples of like management buyouts, we talked about, um, you know, I, I've talked about in the past bank insurance, which was eventually taken out at less than book value. Um, but at a very high, but, at, you know, almost uh, close to 100% premium, 80 to 100% premium over what it originally had said. Um, some things in Japan I was in were taken over by management. Um, Hunter Douglas we talked about, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that stock there were three, four attempts over 15 years to take it private. And then finally they did with also getting a little skin in the game for taking it private too. So not a hundred percent taking it private, but sort of um, that helped, I think, finalize the deal. And then um, we also talked about Cambria, the mm -hmm. automotive company in, in the UK. And that one also, you know, you got a higher price than you had before, but you didn't have an amazing price. But on the other hand, how bad is the price if you compare it to like Virtu or or other UK car dealers because they've all been valued at less than five times EBITDA for seven, eight years or something now, you know, some of them. Um, they haven't consistently traded over five times EBITDA for any one year that I can think of. So you could say, well, the price was what they would get in the public markets. But that is what Buffett's talking about, unfortunately. Management is taking advantage of the individual shareholders, the way they think about stocks as opposed to the way they think about entire businesses. By announcing a deal, 
you can in stocks like Hunter Douglas to a point, although at the end they couldn't. I mean, they got left with the shareholders who would never sell no matter what. You know, that's what ended up with them, which made it hard. They couldn't squeeze out the last 10% or whatever because over time they bought most of it, but they were left with only the people who turned down every tender offer and stuff. Um, well, with Cambria, you know, you can take advantage of those people because it's a small percentage of their portfolio. Some of them are professional money managers, whatever. They're ready to move on to other things. Mm -hmm. And so they can't get together a big enough group to block a deal, right? Whereas if they were um, people who are members of your fa an extended family that also own those shares or something, and you said, well, I want to take it over from this small group, it wouldn't work because they would view the stock differently. But because it's a publicly traded stock... Your, people in publicly traded stocks are going to be taken advantage of by the majority owner or by a potential buyer or even LBOs and things because you can just offer 30% above the past market price and take it yeah. um, mm -hmm. private in a lot of cases, yeah, regardless of how cheap it was. So it could be it could be worth 10 times what it's selling for. You offer 30% more, and you've got a good chance of taking it private. Mm -hmm. Crazy. So he said, at this point, a report card for me is appropriate. In 58 years of Berkshire management, most of my capital allocation decisions have been no better than so-so. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Is that Buffett just That's true. being conservative? You believe that? No, I 100% believe that. Now, in so individual there's, stocks... there's hope for the rest of us, is what you're saying. You're telling me there's I a chance. <laughs> I don't know about that because I don't think that his... His results in stocks have been particularly mediocre. Uh, in buying entire companies, yeah, they have been. I think this is a big explanation of what happened from about the time of the Gen Re deal to today of why Berkshire's performance has not been as good. The stock market got quite expensive around 1996 or so. And Berkshire's last purchases that he talks about here are in 94 and 95 around that area. They do the merger with Gen Re a couple years later. Mm -hmm. um, it's in that neighborhood of the later 90s, in the 90s bubble starting the 90s bubble into the full size of it, that Buffett's uh, performance really weakens a lot. And I think that also explains why he moves to buying entire businesses. There are some advantages to Berkshire to buying entire businesses. It's also why he bought preferred stock. So there's some tax advantages. Um, Berkshire is inefficiently, is an inefficient vehicle for taxation um, mm -hmm. purposes. So it's going to pay more in taxes than you would uh, owning stocks. And um, But it does benefit... It does offset that to some extent, that double taxation issue, in cases where it can collect a dividend from one corporation to another. So in many cases, Berkshire buying a preferred stock would be more attractive to it than you buying the same preferred stock. Um, now, I don't think that matters much because in the cases where Buffett was very successful in preferred stocks with large amounts of money, he would have been better buying uh, prefer preferred convertibles. Uh, he would have been better off buying the common stock. Now, sometimes they worked out okay as fixed investments, um, you know, so as alternatives to bonds. But in general, you know, he just should have bought more like Gillette, more American Express as a common stock as much as he could. You certainly could have done as well better by copying him in those things. Um, but he wouldn't have made investments in things like US Air, uh, Salman Brothers, uh, Champion, um, a bunch of other ones, if it wasn't that he was getting uh, different taxes on that. He also would not have bought a lot of businesses, I think, unless it was do the tax situation. So, I mean, um, there is in the book, uh, of permanent value, they have a, uh, he is quoted in that as talking about that with Dairy Queen, that Dairy Queen was a publicly traded company and he would not have bought it as a stock. They bought it because it was more attractive. And he estimated it as being something like 20% more attractive to them or something based on, on that, that would have to be trade 20 or 30% even lower for him to buy it as a stock. So I think that, his record in buying control businesses is not so great. Uh, his record in stocks is a lot better. There's a lot of stocks. They're all available to you. The owners, mm -hmm. you know, the, the can't block you from buying into them. And um, you get much better prices. In control businesses, his record is very mixed. I think anyone could, could you know, anyone with a lot of common sense and all that could get pretty close to what he's done with control businesses if we're doing it in like a, a hit rate. Now, that doesn't mean that his decisions with very large business uh, purchases have been bad. Uh, but I think that that's true. And part of it is that his ability to buy things in the industries that he likes best is probably very limited. So controlled purchases of financial companies is just not something that Berkshire could probably do a lot of. 
Um, I doubt that he's gotten a chance to buy many brands. Um, you know, he's probably limited in lots of things, whether it's media things or whatever, his usual kind of circle of competence stuff. So food, media, insurance, and banking and all that stuff is probably not where he's getting offers. Getting a lot more offers in retail and a ton of things mm-hmm. related to home building in the 2000s and stuff. And so his record on those are very mixed. I was just thinking about this. Do you think Buffett has ever invested in other funds or anything like that, similar to Munger investing in Lee Lu, Munger investing in all these different things? If you had to guess, or do you think Buffett just kind of sticks to Berkshire and then his personal account? Oh, his personal? Well, I mentioned a permanent value. It has a chapter on his personal account. And I think we have some pretty good estimates about what he's done in his personal account from things he's said, if they're literally true. So at the time of the... um, financial crisis he's quoted as saying to hank paulson that he could put in um a hundred million dollars into something and then that's about 20 percent of his net worth uh, outside of berkshire so that his personal portfolio was about 500 million at that time which sounds about right um we know he was in a ton of reits and he's you know that there's a chapter on mm-hmm. that in the book and uh because he went over the five percent limit on that he also says around the time of the financial crisis that uh, when he says in the buy American because I am one, he says that he's been buying American stocks in his personal portfolio. We know he bought like JP Morgan, for instance, probably for his personal portfolio. And there may uh, end. Uh, he would have owned what? Um, Seritage, uh, right? Mm-hmm. Um, was a personal purchase. Um, so he says in that that he had only owned government bonds a few years earlier. Judging by that, we would know that in the earlier 2000s, shortly after the Um, blow up of the um, dot com stuff he was in REITs looking for them to liquidate and some liquidating stuff there's also like there's a couple other stocks we know of they're not mentioned in the book but I remember reading about them which was a liquidation and stuff so he was in special situations sometime in the early 2000s then he's out of those and only in bonds by the financial crisis Um, we also know he was in Korean stocks because he picked those personally off that manual um, and said they weren't appropriate for Berkshire. That was also early 2000s. So we have some information about like early 2000s stuff Mm -hmm. for for, uh, Berkshire. As far as being in funds and stuff, no, I believe he's never been in funds or anything like that. Berkshire itself has been, has participated in funds run by other people. There was an arbitrage operation that they invested in and some stuff like that. What was that situation? Yeah, and I was just curious, like from a private perspective, if he's done anything. They basically just like seeded someone. There are some things in insurance and um, and things like that. So they're they're people that they've basically. I I mean we don't know all the details of it, but I believe that they ran a arbitrage operation that would have been like what Buffett was doing. Buff would, Buffett would have been doing himself, um, similar to what investment banks would do. Mm-hmm. Um, they had some stuff with Lucadia, which I think would have been similar to. Um, so I think they'd be willing to put in money with some people to manage uh, stuff that way. They've also done some things where people have managed stuff for them for maybe like uh, tax purposes, uh, tax credit purposes um, that we know about. So I think um, my, I don't know. My, my guess is he would never do something like the Lee Lu thing. Um, mm-hmm. It's possible that he would give money to someone to do stuff in markets that he's not involved in. I could see that happening with Berkshire or something at, at one time. So for instance, like, you know, he's doing arbitrage with, um, with Activision and all of that, but I could see certainly arbitrage in certain markets or something um, in different commodities. We talked about how he bought silver and stuff himself. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, yeah, I could see that. And th- w- there's probably things for his personal portfolio. We can guess are probably related to things like that from what we know. They're probably smaller, some leverage things, some supply demand things that might've been in commodities and stuff like that. Probably liquidations. The, the REITs were just like trading below net tangible asset value type stuff. So probably very Ben Graham type things, maybe, maybe bordering on things like when we talk about AQR or something, that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. probably on a, but on a smaller scale and more certain and betting bigger, probably. So if you had to guess like what the Kager on that personal portfolio has been, if we knew it was around half a billion in the financial crisis, what would you guess? Well, I, I don't think it's grown like much at all since then, probably. Really? So... Yeah, because I think it's just idle for long periods of time. We have like no information about him doing anything with it. It's very unclear about that. So I, I we have very very little information since the financial crisis on it, and also the fact that he would buy some personal things that could be in the same category as like a Berkshire. I feel like um, suggests that um, 
he probably hasn't spent much time thinking about it. I think decades ago, he probably spent a brief period of time uh, working on it and made a bunch of money. So, uh, but when that was, I don't know, maybe sometime in the very late seventies to early eighties through the early two thousands. But I think since about the housing crisis, I don't think that he's done much of anything with it. Yeah. I mean, whenever people meet with him, obviously they want to talk about Berkshire and everything around that. If we ever had dinner with him or if we were ever interviewing him, I think I would want to spend the whole time talking to him about his personal account and what he did in there. So we can move on. Okay. So he had said, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Our satisfactory results have been the product of about a dozen truly good decisions. That would be about one every five years and a sometimes forgotten advantage that favors long-term investors such as Berkshire. So I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts on that, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, the hit rate on that from like, uh, you know, a good decision standpoint, one every five years. Well, we've been doing this podcast for five years and I was talking about, I mean, yeah. feel, feel, I mean, how long that feels right. So investors always want to just own stuff all the time. It seems like, so I'm kind of curious, what do you think those good decisions would be those truly good decisions? As he said, if you had to start listing them. Oh, um, well, he talks about two from the nineties that would make sense, which would be things like American Express and Coca Cola. Mm -hmm. Um, he doesn't mention one that actually is unusual, is smaller, so it's from an unusual period, but around two thousand or so, I don't remember exactly when it was, he did also buy as much as he could of um what was then done in Bradstreet so that he could get shares of Moody's when it was spun out. So Moody's was obviously a great one, but it mm -hmm. wasn't big enough size to Berkshire to matter a great deal. Um Washington Post is a good example. Um, in terms of controlled businesses, Seize Candies was a big one. Mm -hmm. National Indemnity, and uh, it, you know, but that's more complicated if he's counting insurance things because insurance is really funding their performance that way. Um, in terms of stocks that we know that they bought, you know, from years ago and everything, one easy way to look at it is what stocks do we know that Buffett bought and that went up like ten times or something? And this is why I mentioned in particular things like media. And financial because this is where they're concentrated. Um, he had uh, affiliated publications, right? Was an amazing one for them. Um, it was along with Washington Post, so both newspapers, um, and then also you know the the ad agencies in that time period also did really well. Those are all concentrated in time period in the um, like. 74 73 something around there time period um in the 1970s um he may have been buying for a few years before then and some of them went down for like three years or something but a lot of them are concentrated in that period um and in terms of acquisitions of total companies you know there's some where he's made very big acquisitions in recent years and so that might matter and that the results haven't been amazing but They've been good enough when combined with um, how they did them that I think matters. There's very few from the 2000s that I would put in that category. The only one that's probably really strong in that is um, the railroad. Um, and then another controlled investment, which they had done also as a individual, uh, also as a public market investment too, though, is uh, Geico. Mm -hmm. So in terms of like total control of a company thing, the ones that have made a lot of difference in terms of size and performance have been um, the railroad, BNSF, and uh, Geico in the last, you know, um, couple decades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Monish Pabrai had uh, tweeted this, and he said these are likely ten out of the twelve, probably not in order. Number one, hiring a Jeet. Two, National Indemnity. Three, Apple. Four, Berkshire Hathaway Energy. Five, BNSF. Six, Geico. Seven Bank of America, eight C's, nine Coke, Coca Cola, uh, ten Amex. He said, "What might the last two? What might be the last two C's and Buffalo News were bought from Blue Chip Float, Cap Cities question mark, Oxy slash Chevron question mark, Gillette question mark." So I thought it was interesting. G G GSEs. Mm -hmm. In fact, he talks. He's talked before about how they made a very big mistake in not going out and buying 
more little savings and loans just because there was a limit of 1% that you could get uh, 1% of the common stock for each savings and loan you own. So they should have just gone out and bought like every little savings and loan that was out there and stuff. Um, so, uh, but they sold those eventually, right? So, um, but what I'm talking about is um, like Fannie and Freddie type stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So um, those get forgotten now, but they were good performers for them for the time that they were in them. Mm-hmm. When he says the hit rate is one great idea every five years, how do you think mm-hmm. about that? Do you agree with that? Um, yes. Yeah. Do you think investors should almost lower their expectations as they're sifting through a bunch of these names and raise the hurdle if the world's greatest investor is saying, hey, look, it really comes down to about a dozen ideas over my lifetime, which is a very long life, and the hit rate is one every five years. I mean, how do you sort of, what's your takeaway from that? Well, a few things. I'm not sure that I've done better than one every uh, five years. Certainly, you have more ideas than one every five years, but Mm -hmm. you would have to recognize the idea, bet large enough on it, and then hold on to it for a while. Um, So he means not that he had a good idea once every five years, but that that they benefited from his realization of a good idea fully enough. Yes. Those really Uh, move the needle. Yes. Well, we're talking about the personal portfolio. He could come up with ideas for his personal portfolio, but mm-hmm. they can't move the needle. So that's part of the issue is that Berkshire's too big. Uh, the other part is that there's long stretches of time in which he doesn't have any good ideas. So, you know, um, from the late 1990s through about the financial crisis, Berkshire has virtually no good investments that it made. You know, like I just mentioned, uh, Dun & Bradstreet or something is like the only thing that they did. Um Anything else, I mean, if they had been in cash instead of being in that stuff, I don't know how big the difference would have been. And then they could have gone bigger into things afterwards. Um, you know, they did buy some stuff that worked out fine. Like they bought some junk things, um, but they couldn't do it in huge scale. The market was just expensive, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's very difficult. When they're using almost all their money to buy private businesses, it probably indicates that the public markets are too expensive for them or that they just can't find things in what they want there. Um, and so they have to resort to that. And he says that you don't really get good prices on that. So that's how he's judging it. I mean, Berkshire's ad performance, you know, which they cover in the first page uh, in market value versus the S&P is 10%. Okay. So at times Berkshire has been uh, leveraged about 1.5 times to, to one. Uh, however, there's long stretches of time in which as best we can gauge his performance in stocks, it's about 20% a year. So the stock performance is actually similar. Uh, Buffett's stock picking at times has been similar to Berkshire's return, even though they use leverage. So what's happening with it? Uh, the, the leverage, in effect, is leveraging okay prices on the business side, right? So like it, it's allowing Berkshire to invest fully by being you know by being leveraged up so that results that would otherwise not be so great on the the private business side um look okay if they're done with leverage so like when i gave the example of the railroad let's say they bought the railroad at 20 times uh you know the the part the 75 percent or whatever that they bought that um he didn't already own at about 20 times normalized free cash flow or something like that um they borrowed a bunch of the money to do that for a little while. Then they also have the credit rating they have, and then they can also not guarantee the credit of the the um, railroad or whatever. So there's some benefits to that, like because it had a, I don't know, uh, maybe the market cap was three times the debt or something. So it had a bunch of debt. But if you just get an okay price on the railroad, let's say, let's say it was something like a 5% yield or something, um, so you're paying 20 times own earnings, um, then with a little leverage it works out. Right, if you're using float or something with owner's money, it, it it might do what the historical return in the S and P over time has been, but it won't kind of beat the S and P. It, it may be the S and P going forward if the S and P is really overvalued, but that's kind of the thing that they face. Um, so when we get into things like his returns in the '70s from stocks, that's part of the really impressive result is that two things were happening: one, he bought these stocks at really low values you know and they went up a lot so there's stocks that went up 10 times or something that we talked about in media and advertising and all that stuff but also uh, although their combined ratio was not good they had a bunch of float so a huge amount there you know there's there's a higher degree of leverage back then in the business and more of it is allocated to stocks 
And so the, their best years really are years where there's a significant amount of float and it's in um, stocks. As float comes down and as you buy private businesses, I think you just see the difficulty of it that, um, I mean, it's ironic because we talk about efficient markets and public markets, but really the market is more efficient in the private space for them to buy control of entire businesses. That's where it's harder to get inefficiencies. Mm -hmm. So the secret sauce, you think he talks about Coca-Cola and Amex as examples because those are two businesses that everybody could visualize and would be familiar with? Uh, it's possible, but like I said, with the exception of, um, Moody's, these are two of the best, mm -hmm. um, stock investments that he's made in the last, um, 30 years or so, 25 years. And, um, also the other examples would be like things that you buy total control of. Mm -hmm. So I think he wanted to use stock examples. I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. And so, th stocks that they own for a really, really long time. So yeah. these, these are two. If he, they still own Wells Fargo, he might have used Wells Fargo as an example, mm -hmm. you know, going back a few years. Yeah. Yeah. My takeaway from this section was one word, time, really, owning it for a very long time. So for Coca-Cola, they purchased uh, $1.3 billion worth, 400 million shares. The cash dividend in 1994 was $75 million. By 2022, that $75 million was $704 million. <laughs> and he, you know, talks about how all they had to do was just cash the quarterly dividend checks. Uh, then he talks about American Express as well. The cost was 1.3 billion, and the dividends received from Amex have grown from 41 million to 302 million um, today. And that he also believes those two dividends will continue to grow in the future. Uh, but he does say these dividend gains, though pleasing, are far from spectacular. Mm -hmm. uh, but they bring with them important gains in stock prices. And he says that year on our Coke investment was valued at $25 billion, uh, which is obviously a lot more than the $1.3 billion at cost. And Amex was $22 billion, uh, which is a lot higher than the $1.3 billion at cost in Amex as well. So any mm -hmm. thoughts on those two investments? Yeah, well, one thing is if you run the math on it, uh, the dividend growth rate is pretty high. Like it's significantly higher at Coke than the growth in the business and stuff. So it may surprise people how much the dividend's grown. Um, and then uh, American Express is a little, uh, not as good, but it's fine. And it might be a bit cheaper and it's a uh, bigger reason is that it's buying back stock you know is, is why the the dividend is lower um but yeah I, I think that the dividend growth rate in those cases is you know a, a meaningful part of it and then in the case of coke uh re-rating of a multiple mm -hmm. um for much of the time he's owned it however it probably is one of the stocks he was talking about when he said not in this letter but he said in the past i probably should have sold some of our largest holdings during the bubble meaning he maybe he should have sold coke in 2000 so maybe he should have only held it for 10 to 15 years instead of um, for 30 some years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But other than that, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on the past year in brief section? Talks a little bit about purchasing Allegheny. Uh, we've covered that on the podcast. I did think it was interesting when, what you hit on earlier, since purchasing our first property casualty insurer in 1967, Berkshire's float has increased a thousand fold through acquisitions, operations, and innovations. Uh, but of course that's not captured in there. Financial statements, um, my takeaway mainly from this was just how important float is to Berkshire's operations and how uh, crucial or strong it's been to the success of the company. Yeah, so there's kind of two things. One is that Buffett's record is pretty close um, to the record of Berkshire, but that his ability to do it in size has only been because of float. Mm -hmm. So like Berkshire, if you're talking about Berkshire's record as a stock, it is driven very, very heavily by float. Um, Buffett as a stock picker, sure, if he uh, stayed running a fund and he distributed money every once in a while, said, okay, I'm going to pay this out and stuff, ran, ran it like Renaissance or something, um, then yeah, his record would be really good over a huge period of time, but he couldn't grow to bigger and bigger sizes. The way they've been able to do it is with float. 
Um, and so the, the success of Berkshire has a ton to do with float and the miscalculations of the value of Berkshire always have to do with people saying it's like a closed end fund and all that, which it has nothing in common with those things. It's like a bank or an insurer or something like that, that's able to get money at low cost and then earn a spread over it because it, you know, it has so much money in float that they talk about there at such low cost that if you turn around and you invest that even in things like uh, bonds, then you could make a lot of money. And uh, I think, you know, obviously people don't think about that. There are some calculations that people make of the stock, not people who are probably listening to this podcast, but who but basically just valued in terms of liquidation thing, which would look at things like price to book and all that. But effectively, let's say it has 100, you know, this is 100, um, what does he say? They are up to 160 some billion in float. Um, if you have that much and a two year yields, you know, 5% or whatever, um, then given how long the, you have on your float and everything, you can invest a hundred percent into that because actually it, even if Berkshire stopped writing tomorrow or something, it would take that long for it's a book to run off to a significant, even a meaningfully meaningful part of it. It's not going to have more than 50%. I mean, it's not gonna have a hundred percent of the float roll off in two years and it's probably depending on what they're in, not going to have 50% roll off in a year. So, um, you know, you're going to earn money on that, which is billions and billions of dollars. You know, the, the spread that you're going to earn on that is just, uh, that we're talking about is, you know, um, it is something like, you know, one and a half billion a, a quarter or something. And that's excluded from the valuation of the company when people talk about it, as if they're using owner money when they're not. They're, they're, it's the same as using deposits or something. So it's it's incredibly important for Berkshire that it has that float. And he also, with the Allegheny thing, the thing he did say, which is interesting, is like that they will benefit Allegheny from being part of Berkshire because of Berkshire's uh, um, strong balance sheet and their approach, which is basically that they're going to not um, lay off risk on anyone else. Because I think that Berkshire's the only insurer that literally does not pass on risk to anyone else. If you look at like tables of the largest insurance groups, even those that are very, very highly rated do maybe just to manage their earnings or whatever, um, seed some risk to others, mm -hmm. right? So even if they themselves own reinsurers and everything, they seed stuff to other reinsurers. Berkshire's premiums and the amount that they're keeping is the same. They're, they're, they're basically keeping everything for themselves, which means that if you buy a company that was seeding some, then you're going to keep more of the risk for yourself. So even if they write the exact same amount of business, you're going to keep more on your balance sheet. So it's kind of like if they bought a bank that was selling the loans off to someone else, now they're going to buy that bank and keep all of it for their own book. That's the kind of approach when they buy an insurer. Mm -hmm. So he gets into talking about share buybacks, kind of throwing jabs at the politics of it, and then taxes. Were you surprised that he's, did you think he was kind of coming out a little bit fiery than normal on this? Or what? Uh, no. Okay. I think the share buyback thing probably bothers him a lot. Okay. The why? Tax. And why is that? Because it encourages stupid and unethical behavior, mm -hmm. right? Because you're taxing something, which is an ethical use of it. Um, I think it also bothers him because of some of the ways he's talked about trade, for instance. You'll notice that the way he talks about the buyback being beneficial to everyone, not harming anyone, is exactly the way that people... Um, 250 years ago or whatever, um, talked about uh, trade, uh, talked about free trade and the importance of it. And what, what his point is, is um, they're not forcing anyone. This isn't a deal. You're not, for instance, it, we talked about management buyouts or something. If you yeah. tax people for squeezing out shareholders, that's a different thing. Uh, this is something in which the people who are selling are electing to sell. And the people who are buying are buying because they think it benefits others that way. It's also helping to not waste the capital on other things. Um, so it, to him, I think it's the same as if you said, okay, let's tax, um, you know, voluntary trade between people. Um, it, it, and so it's just not a good idea. I also think that it probably bothers him because it, it does encourage not unethical behavior and because you don't really need to encourage more buybacks um, I mean, less buybacks. You don't need to encourage people to not buy back stock. As mm -hmm. we know, um, management is very inclined not to buy back stock. They would prefer not to buy back stock. They would prefer to expand the business, have a bigger business to mm -hmm. um, run, obviously. They would prefer acquiring things. They would prefer doing lots of things other than uh, treating their partners who don't have a, um, a 
organized vote often very well. You know, they don't have representation on the board and stuff usually. I mean, they can, in theory, all together as a disorganized group win a vote sometimes. But um, they're basically not very well represented. And uh, they can be mistreated as kind of silent partners because individually, like, um, that's kind of what they become. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, this also, you'll notice in the very beginning of the letter, he says something interesting where he talks about individuals. And he... The Sabres is probably so. Yeah. So he says, but specifically says individuals. He's probably annoyed with the ESG stuff and the Black Rocks and the Vanguards and things of the world. Um but he decided not to go after them and to say bad things about them. But he, I don't think he has good things to say about them anymore. He made a very strong point of saying individuals. I think he's kind of shifted in terms of how he's going to talk about shareholders and stuff. I think they're going to totally ignore passive shareholders and say that they don't count. Um, you know, uh, indexing shareholders. Uh, and, you know, but to some extent that's his fault because he wanted to get in the S&P. So, yeah, why did know, he slant it? comes with it. Yeah, no, that's why he did it. Yeah, you yeah. Think so? I mean, he may have, he may have, yes, he may have even written a section and then deleted it or something. But it's clear recently that he's gotten annoyed with all that stuff. Yeah, um, and I think the share buyback. Yeah, individuals has, as in not institutions or just passive correct. owners of the company. Yeah, that's funny. Yes, I didn't, I didn't pick up and, on that. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that's connected <laughs> with him because his one of his really really big things in terms of ethics and stuff with Buffett is uh poor stewardship yeah. right uh-huh. so the the requirement to uh use other people's money properly and when yep. it's entrusted with you to treat them well not to abuse it to take whatever things and 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 all that um so which sometimes is a little different from other things he's he's seen as being very um his politics being very left wing or whatever things but this is a big part of his concern about it, uh, it you know, remember the uh, the boys town thing right that was the one time he gave a story to someone and everything and that's exactly what the problem was there is 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 um mishandling of it bringing in money when you actually were uh you know continuing to bring in more and more money when you actually were spending more than you needed anyway you know you didn't need to bring in any more money um so i think his problem with the stock buyback thing honestly is that it's encouraging management to do to mistreat their owners and not to think of their owners as partners. And that is a bigger part of the whole stakeholder issue mm-hmm. to think about, is that as you widen what groups you think you're responsible for, then you become responsible to no one. I mean, in a sense, when you say our our act, when you start your annual report by saying our actions touch all the world and you know um, and all that stuff, then you're saying we're not responsible to our shareholders in yeah. a special way. We're not responsible to the particular country we're in in a special way because we're we're for everyone and all things and stuff. You know, as you do that, so you can have a few stakeholders if you say, um, you know, our our customers, our um, our owners, whatever the things that you would often see in reports. But as you broaden that out, then it becomes more and more of an issue of um, then you don't feel special responsibility for certain groups. And I think he feels special responsibility for shareholders and wants the companies that he's invested in to feel that special responsibility. And the share buyback tax is very um, damaging that way. Mm -hmm. It's a good excuse for people not to do it. And then also he probably... um, The other thing is it wasn't talked about a lot because it's a very small tax, but that's how all tax... You know, usually you start as a very small tax and then you can change it later when you Mm -hmm. want to. Um, So... Yeah, I think that that's not something that he's particularly happy about. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think he's also tried definitely in recent years to avoid uh, being as involved in political stuff because he had some bad experiences with that. I think mainly from the early Obama period with the Buffett tax and all that. And so I think since then he's even said sometimes when asked about it, why haven't you said as much about you're supporting this person doing this and I feel this way about this and everything that um, he tries not to call people out on that as much. So mm-hmm. hmm. he talks about his um, comfortableness holding a ton of cash. Um, said as for the future, Berkshire will always hold a boatload of cash and U.S. Treasury bills along with a wide array of businesses. We will also avoid behavior that could result in any un- uncomfortable cash needs at inconvenient times, including financial panics and unprecedented insurance losses. 
our CEO will always be the chief risk officer. You have any thoughts on that aspect? I mean, he's always been very comfortable holding cash. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, not really. He, the same thing that he said before the, you know, again, it's a, that's a, um, subtle way of criticizing every financial institution, every investment bank, every whatever, who has a designated risk chief risk officer. He's saying the chief risk officer is the CEO. There should be no chief risk officer. Sure, I think. And in fact, it. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, that's something that like government and stuff likes to have is that regulators like to have the chief risk officer and saying that you can't do that. Um, yeah. So, and again, it's a stewardship type thing because if your chief risk officer, whoever signs off on it, then you feel like, oh, well then it's not my responsibility. I said, I'm going to take this risk. They said, it's okay. So it's okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Whereas if you're taking it personally and you're the buck stops with you, then you have a different attitude about it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think it goes to that same thing. But again, he does it in a nice way yeah. of saying that they don't need the chief risk officer, but he used that language specifically because others uh, mention chief risk officers and stuff and do it as a way of not having the CEO be the one who handles um, uh, responsibility for all those risks and has to judge that. Mm -hmm. So then he talks more about federal taxes, right? Is this sort of a continuation on <laughs> uh, being upset and, and criticizing like the uh, share buyback tax, right? How he's basically saying, hey, we do contribute Berkshire's contribution via the corporate income tax was $32 billion during the decade, almost exactly a tenth of 1% of all money that the Treasury collected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure what this is about. This has started, I mean, he's done this at times a long time ago in terms of the size of it, um, about the company and everything. But he doesn't usually criticize when he's talking about the amount of taxes that they pay. Mm -hmm. However, he also is, de you'll notice a difference in that when talking about personal tax and stuff that he pays, he says they're under tax. He never yeah. says Berkshire's under tax. Mm -hmm. So there's clear, it's not that he's saying that Berkshire doesn't pay enough or something. Um, I notice it more since they've been involved in the heavily regulated businesses. And I do feel that maybe Buffett is concerned with, um, maintaining good relations with the government and stuff now that they're in energy and railroad um, and avoiding um, criticism of the company overall for its ownership of those things and people going after them and stuff. So yeah, I do think there maybe is a bit of a shift that way. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, well, in case these words don't mean much, let me paint a picture for you and tell you just how much we paid in taxes. And he says, imagine piling up 32 billion, the total of Berkshire's 2012 to 2021 federal income tax payments. Now the stack grows to more than 21 miles in height. If you uh, converted it to $100 bills and stacked it up, about three times the level at which commercial airplanes usually cruise. So he's really hitting on that. Um, I, I immediately thought to myself, I'm like, so did he just calculate this himself? Has somebody thought through this thought exercise? He just probably ran the math himself and estimated what it would be. Yeah, probably. I mean, if you yeah. know the size of uh, <laughs> bills and stuff, then it's not difficult to do that. Uh -huh. um, there is, I, d I didn't think about this before, but actually when I was reading, I did think about it. He doesn't w get into it much, but it is possible that part of his reason for discussing this a little bit is um, he wants to sound very positive on America's future as a country at the same time as not being super positive on its um, budget deficit mm -hmm. and its inflation situation and the likelihood of that continuing. And I don't know what that's all about. If he fears that there'll be higher taxes in the future or he, or what, but I, I think he has some awareness of, of that issue. Um, and he gives it very short mention in the letter that, you know, there's almost no mention of it, but. Mm -hmm. And then he spends some time talking about Charlie. And he had yeah. said, here are a few of his thoughts, many lifted from a very recent podcast. So I was looking, I'm like, well, where's this podcast? So internet, you have to do your thing and send it over if you could find it. A lot of this uh, stuff has been said over the years, but, you know, good ideas don't go stale. So it was nice to, um, you know, read a lot of these again. I mean, a lot of them from like Poor Charlie's Almanac. And I actually wonder, mm -hmm. people were speculating if 
I guess they're doing like a video form of poor Charlie's Almanac. I saw a two minute clip. Okay. I think it was the Stripe guys, one of them, or interviewing Munger at his house. So I'm thinking maybe that's the podcast that Buffett just saw before it was uh, publicly available. But hey, man, my life is complete because Buffett, you know, he listens to podcasts apparently. So I was. Uh, yeah. Did you yeah. ever think that? the word podcast would appear in a it's got to um, be the first time that, that's letter. ever yeah that's got to be the first time <laughs> so i was like we made it we made it he's definitely searched <laughs> warren buffett or berkshire i'm just gonna guess he's had he's definitely come across our podcast mm-hmm. um but yeah i don't know i mean do you know of a podcast that has come out on munger no okay no anything from this section that stood out to you no, I mean, obviously, it's different in that he doesn't normally do this. Mm-hmm. So, um, dedicate a section but, to him. Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's not a specific, you know, anniversary of whatever things and stuff. So, yeah. Um, I think you talked about in recent letter, I don't remember which one it was, if it was a year ago or something about whether it was a victory lap or what sort of uh, the letter was like, you know. Um, this is yep. definitely um, uh, doing that with with Charlie, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Charlie's ninety nine, right? Ninety nine years old. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, and with COVID and everything that happened with them not having in person meetings, mm-hmm. and we've talked about that. Um, yeah, I think that that has definitely changed the um tone of some things i think like well, there's a tone of the meeting or things since then uh because of that happening not so much that there was a pandemic or something but that it caused there not to be meetings for a little while and everything mm-hmm. i did think it was interesting that the daily journal didn't have an in-person meeting this year but obviously berkshire had a meeting last year in omaha perhaps that was just a difference of the states that those two companies operated or whatever but i did i thought it was interesting my guess would be that it's warren doesn't do zoom and charlie is probably on zoom 24 7 yeah um and it's more of that kind of thing yeah mm-hmm. and yeah, obviously I, easier for charlie you know yeah yeah charlie has said that he uh he really enjoys zoom so mm-hmm. yeah, yeah yeah maybe right on that i also think charlie would be more likely to do uh you know with to do something where he talks if he can just switch from talking to one person to the next while sitting in the same place that way. Um, yeah, no, I think that Buffett definitely would like the crowd and everything there. Yeah. I don't think it's going to go virtual under, um, but well, I mean, it was like basically had to then, but other than that, I don't think it will be virtual during Buffett's time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Munger did say that he did have COVID and that he had sniffles mm-hmm. for like a day or something. And then he was all good. So, I mean, this man just built different Jeff. Yeah, he said he had like a bunch of vaccinations and stuff, right? So it was yeah. later in the COVID thing. Yeah. Uh-huh. So uh, obviously uh, Omaha this year, he goes through his normal pitch, talks about C's candies. Uh, I love the plugs about his own product. There's um, a shocking statistic on C's candies. Did you see that? About what? How, this 10 sales per minute? How much they sold? How much the weight that they sold? Yeah, when I read the first part, I was... It's, it's funny because I read the first part. He says... What does he say first? Um, 11 tons. Yeah. So when he says the t- that's what it is. Yeah. So he says the tons first. So it's funny because a few paragraphs later, he breaks down everything about that. Yeah. When I read the tons, I'm doing in my head like, okay, so how many individual sales is that? <laughs> and how many, you know, <laughs> and he does it like two paragraphs later, but because it's an incredible amount. I'm like, okay, so these might be what? Two pound boxes. And yeah. Then, you know, yeah. You're picturing like what a ton looks like. <laughs> I think like a dump truck. How, how much of that is a ton? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah, so I I agree with you on what your thoughts were. I was like, oh, it's kind of, I don't know. I mean, I've benefited from a lot of Buffett's other letters. So, I mean, mm-hmm. can't uh, judge him. But I agree with you when you had said that you had felt like you didn't think this would be a good representation or learn a lot about Berkshire if you were going to invest in the company. Right. Yeah. To me, it just seemed shorter, kind of more just things he has said in the past but i mean can't judge the man for that right yeah and there is a lot about the decisions that they made Mm -hmm. right and how the decision so that part of it is very important and maybe doesn't get explained enough about berkshire um 
I'm not sure all the reasons for getting into discussing it that way. It's always interesting about why I choose to discuss what topics in what year. Mm-hmm. Um, so I like that kind of stuff because otherwise we just have discussions of share buybacks or whatever things. He does do a good job of making the letters timeless so that when you have an entire collection of them and read it, it makes sense. Um, we don't appreciate that now because we read the 70s or 80s yeah. letters and, and don't think, oh, why is it not just constantly about inflation and stuff? You know, we don't read it and go, oh, why isn't he discussing Watergate? You know, mm-hmm. but when we read the, the because you don't think about it back then. But um, when we read the letters during COVID and stuff, it was no, notable how little specific discussion there was of COVID and how little specific discussion there was of inflation. There's a little bit more of that at the annual meeting. But he tries to stick to things that are not just like that one year type discussion. Mm -hmm. So there is the share buyback thing, which is specific to now in it. I think the more timeless thing that's in it is this discussion of how few um, purchases that they've made have mattered so much. Yeah. And how others have not done so good. He even says, um, I mean, he says two things. One, he breaks down if it didn't do well, like if it got bond-like returns, how small a percentage it would become over time. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, And he breaks that down for people, which is helpful. But then he also even says um, something like, uh, does he say, um, I don't remember if he says, uh, he uses a pretty large number, uh, a pretty large word describing the number, like a great many or whatever, um, uh, of the the businesses are not good. They're marginal. He calls them marginal. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's a recognition that I think rarely is made about Berkshire, that in terms of numbers, there's a large number of businesses that are not very good inside of Berkshire. Um, uh, there's a smaller number of very good businesses that are worth a lot more than book value and all of that, but it's a mixed bag that way. Mm-hmm. So any final thoughts? Anything else on the Berkshire letter from Mr. Buffett? Uh, nope. Very good. Very good. Well, we could uh, hop over to PowerPoint, but we have some emails, but we're not going to spend too much time on it because I actually want to get into our topic, uh, which came from an email to you. Okay. And it's about this idea of like asymmetry in asymmetric investments. And, uh, Um, Somebody had emailed you saying, I've been reading about Ted Weschler's uh, Dillard's investment and wanted to know what's your opinion on the investment. What do you think gave him the conviction that it wasn't a value trap? It would stay at similar or worse prices for many years without being able to obtain a good return. Also, do you think he thought in advance that the return could be as good as it has been? I was curious about that when I was reading through this. And then he provided a link where somebody gave... Uh, a background to the investment that I thought we could use uh, right. for the podcast. But when did he invest in uh, Dillard's? I remember when the news came out, it was like peak pandemic, right? It was 2020 sometime. And um, what's the ticker for? Is it DDS? Is that right? Yes, DDS. So we could see what has happened. The part that was super interesting to me, Jeff, is if you pull up like an all time mm-hmm. chart, right? <laughs> It's, I mean, okay, so 2020, let's say the average, I mean, he bought what, around like 30 to 25, 30, 25 to $30 a share, somewhere around there. And this guy goes into mm-hmm. it, but this hasn't been an investment where it's like, oh, you're just back to pre-COVID highs, right? In, you know, 2015 or whatever. I mean, the stock has just gone up multiples higher than it ever has been in its history. So it is an interesting stock uh, to look at and study and try to understand, hey, what happened here? Something that I also thought was interesting, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it, right? So Ted invests, presumably, I mean, he has an LBO background, private equity, stuff like that, but he presumably invests like Buffett, right? High quality companies. At least that's what he preaches when he talks in public. He did do a podcast, Mm -hmm. uh, I believe in 2021, where he talked about things. It was all about buying the great businesses, right? Munger, the same thing. (laughs) But you look at a few of their huge winners in life have come from almost breaking their rules a little bit, right? When you think about Munger's yeah. investment in Tenneco, now you think about Ted's investment in Dillard's. Um, and it reminded me of Munger's quote from the Daily Journal meeting. And this only comes with experience. When he said, a young man knows the rules and an old man knows when to break the rules. 
So clearly they just saw the opportunity there. Um, mm -hmm. But I thought that was interesting because something clearly has changed with the business because it's the valuation is way higher than it's ever been. Um, but uh, so he was talking about, you know, good versus perfect as an investment. And uh, we could go into it. But I guess, I mean, do you have any initial thoughts on this idea of asymmetry? Is it an overused financial term? Personally, I think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but before yeah. we get into so, it. Right. So we should explain this. So this is from the after dinner investor yep who you can see the website you know so you can go to the website that you can see it on the, the video and stuff if you're if you're watching this on the video but he also is on um the punch card investing on youtube so if you if you haven't seen his website this is that website he is not the person the afternoon investor is not the person who sent this in uh actually i've gotten this more than once so that's why i forwarded it over to you it was floating around twitter too is, yeah. Um, but I mean, I've got more than one email asking us to do this okay. from different people. Very good. Now, I mean, not, I shouldn't say asking us to do it. They did not ask us to do it. Uh, saying, I, I want to understand this better and stuff, talking to me, not, not necessarily for us to do in the podcast. But because this happened more than once from different people, I said, okay, well, you know, obviously, like you said, it's floating around and stuff that people are looking at this, reading it. So, uh, so the analysis here that we're going from, that we're, we're highlighting everything, may not be have anything to do with uh ted weschler's thoughts about it really mm -hmm. obviously it's it's through the prism of this blog post and then also um we may not be uh ag agreeing in terms of like how we would analyze it with how the after dinner investor would analyze it sure mm -hmm. same thing right so so it's like three levels here when we're looking at it we're looking at we're going back in the past to look at dealers but it's like how did he actually look at it how's the after dinner investor looking at it and how you know would we look at it but Anyway, so uh, this is very easy for people watching the video to understand all of this, but I just want that clear for the podcast because it sounds like we've got some, you know, like we're in Ted's brain or something that we're doing this. So, um, and I also want to make it really clear that this was not sent by the author of the write up, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, go ahead with what you've got highlighted there. So, I mean, I'm just kind of curious. Do you believe that asymmetric uh, investments come around like frequently? Have you even come across one that you would categorize as being? an asymmetric upside or having extreme asymmetry where there was a lot of different ways to win. Do you think about it in terms like that? Or do you think about it more so from like a margin of safety perspective? Hey, there's a lot of layers to this. It's trading below book value. It's trading below, you know, private market value. How do you typically think about that? Yeah. The second one, I mean, it does happen. There are ones like that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, we've talked about, um, Amar precious metals in the past. So mm -hmm. if something happened, then it makes a bunch of money. But if you, if you say that there's never going to be volatility, then it doesn't make any money. But at the time it was trading at a price that kind of assumed there'd never be volatility again in, in gold and silver and things like that. Um, so that happens. We've all talked about other ones um, that would fall into that same sort of category. Net nets tend, you know, the net nets that are huge winners are always going to fall into this category, to be honest, um, where there's not a lot of downside, but then they, People go, why did that net net explode like that? Well, something happened in the industry, and so it just temporarily, you know, changed things. Um, so, yeah, a lot of net nets and things have that sort of asymmetry, although you often don't discover it ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Like, when you look at it, you think, oh, this is boring, nothing will ever happen with this, and then something surprises you that happens, you know? Because when something's so cheap, it actually has a lot of upside potential. People always underestimate the upside potential because if it gets re rated all like a real business, then the upside potential is going to be huge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, imagine if you buy like a two or a three PE, which those opportunities don't come mm -hmm. around that much. And and by nature, they shouldn't, right? And perhaps there's a little stickiness to it or hairiness if you're going to find companies like that. But, you know, if a company goes from a two or three PE to a 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, and then has growth on top of it, I mean, that's where you could really make insane returns. Um, so he talks about this idea of like good versus perfect and good investment ideas and perfect investment ideas look similar. And then he continues on. He says, but oftentimes the margin of safety is smaller than we think it is. The brand isn't as strong as we think. The real estate isn't as valuable. The product is not as sticky, et cetera. This is why investing is difficult. Our natural bias is towards action, which kind of looping back to Buffett's one every one big idea that was successful every five years. Yes, he had more ideas in between, but just the ones that really move the needle, right? Our natural bias is towards action. We want to find investing ideas, so we end up making too many purchases of merely good ideas, and we fail to be patient and load up on the perfect ideas. So to set the stage, this author, he does 
conclude later on that he did think that the Dillard's investment was a perfect uh, investment or a perfect idea. He says good looks like perfect. That's what makes things difficult. Uh, but perfect is different. With perfect investments, the downside is smaller than the good investments, and it is also more defined, and you have a higher confidence level in your understanding of the very limited downside. And on the upside, with perfect investments, the upside is much larger than the upside you get from good investments. Good and perfect investments have the same basic outline, but it's the degree of downside confidence levels and upside that separate perfect investments from good investments. So that kind of reminded me of uh, Greenblatt's, right? When he talked about like how he sizes his positions, his position sizes mm -hmm. are not the ones that he thinks he's going to make the most money, the most amount of money on or It was the ones that he felt like he wouldn't lose any money. So kind of this idea of confidence, right? And we've spoken a lot recently about what does confidence mean in investing? Do you have any thoughts on that section? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, it's difficult to know the difference between um, you have a high degree of confidence that something's going to make money, that so it's really cheap, and the upside because of that cheapness. So a lot of times people, th when you think that something is very, very safe, you tend to underestimate the upside. So what you're doing is when you're saying, oh, this has a tremendous margin of safety, often you're underestimating future circumstances under which it could have tremendous upside. Because what you're saying is it's really, really cheap. But I don't think it has a lot of upside is kind of what you're saying when you say I'm very certain about this, but I don't feel like it has the the best, you know, like it might not be the biggest winner. But a lot of times you underestimate that and actually the things are most certain and intended to become your biggest winner. Mm -hmm. So he says, I have a great example of a perfect of a perfect investment. The Dillard's investment by Ted Weschler comes to mind sometime likely in 2020. I wish I remember when the news came out. Uh, Weschler began buying Dillard stock. By September 29th, he crossed the 5% threshold and showed up in a 13G. He likely paid $25 to $30 a share. Call it 30. Today, Dillard's is at a $360 uh, share price. And in December, they're going to pay a $15 special dividend. With the special dividend capital return to date, he's likely at a 12 to 13 bagger in less than two years time. Weschler's investment in Dillard's was a perfect investment. And we pull it up right now. Uh, Dillard's is at $358 uh, per share. So yeah, that's been a huge home run. He had to actually get approval, I believe, from Berkshire to purchase the stock, if I'm correct about that. Um, not like that's really relevant to the investment. But he continues on. It was a perfect not just because of the result, but because of the situation. In the third quarter of 2020, Dillard's had 22 million shares outstanding at $30 a share. That's a market cap of $660 million. Net debt was $561 million, but tangible book value per share was $63, double the share price. So despite the net debt, Dillard's was selling for less than half of tangible book value. Why? I believe it was the real estate. On the books, after depreciation, the gross property plant and equipment was at $1.4 billion. According to their 2019 annual report for the fiscal year ending February 1st, 2020, Dillard's owned approximately 43.7 million square feet of store space across 285 stores in 29 states. That's on page 10. Then on page F10, they say property and equipment owned by the company is stated at cost, that's important, uh, which includes related interest costs incurred during periods of construction, less accumulated depreciation and amortization. This all makes me think that the after depreciation and on the books that cost real estate property plant equipment it's worth way more than the stated 1.4 billion the stores they own the 43.7 million square feet was very likely bought at prices way less than they're worth today and just because depreciation is on the books it doesn't mean those properties depreciated in real world value so do you remember that nebraska furniture mart podcast he did he kind of mm -hmm. talked about, he didn't specifically say Dillard's, but I think the person asked him about finding investment ideas. And I think he had said, just kind of, they jump out at you reading the newspapers or just reading things that other people aren't reading. And I believe he had said that he was reading a furniture periodical. So I don't think he right. specifically said Dillard's, but he had said, hey, sometimes ideas just kind of jump out at you from just really random places. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. During fiscal 2019, the company received cash proceeds of $30.6 and realized 
a gain of 20.3 million, primarily related to the sale of six store properties. That sentence shows that two thirds of the sale value were gains. So it does look like the properties are worth more than book value. Who knows if those six stores represent the average value of the other 285? Likely not, as they might have sold some of their worst performing stores and least valuable properties, question mark. Who knows? Well, actually, we can, but just for one thing to people understand, he knows how many square feet they had. They had about 45 million square feet. Yeah. And he knows what's carried on the books at at 1.4 billion. 1.4 billion is 1,400 million. So you can convert that into it and say that it's 1,400 million divided by 44.7. So 1,400 divided by 44.7. You can see that on price per square foot, it's carried on the books at a fairly low value. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, tremendously low value. In fact, the replacement cost could be a lot higher because it's being carried because you can just do that division and see that, right? Mm -hmm. So you would expect it to be carried at like hundreds of dollars a square foot or something. It's being carried at tens of dollars a square foot. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Okay. He says, and you could also do a heritage like valuation on the 43.7 million square feet they own. Let's say they can rent that square footage at $14 a foot, which he says is conservative. Assuming the cost it takes to redevelop some of the properties, uh, $14 a foot times 43.7 million square feet equals 611 million times roughly a 50% net operating income NOI margin. That gives you 300 million as an annual NOI. Give it a conservative 10% cap rate. We're looking at 3 billion in real estate value. So again, building sort of a case for, hey, there's a lot of tangible uh, equity here in this business. Um, yeah, and the replacement cost is probably very high. Yeah, because you can ask what would it take to replace almost 45 million square feet? And obviously you're going to get a number that's very high, mm -hmm. you know, higher than the number he just mentioned. Yeah. So are we back to the private market analysis, what a private buyer would pay or have to pay to build it yourself? Yeah. I mean, sure. I mean, obviously, like uh, Amazon has a deal with what Kohl's, I think it's a Kohl's, one of those department stores to take returns and stuff for them and, and things like that. So obviously some of these companies, um, if they want to do things, uh, you know, in, in um, locations need to have some sort of presence that way. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a question of like, well, what would someone pay to buy this thing? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So he says, whether you take the price on the books of 1.4 billion minus the 561 million of net debt, and you're looking at a tangible book value of 800 million versus the market cap of 660 million, or if you take the rosier, but still likely conservative, heritage like approach, valuing the real estate after net debt at around 2.4 billion. Either way, you've got a big margin of safety because you're buying that own real estate net of the debt for less than it is worth. So again, he's talking about asymmetry. There's downside protection. You're getting this, um, you know, not even talking about the income or the actual business itself. There's a lot of, uh, what do you say? The, the book value was two times what he was paying, right? Something like that. Book value per share yeah. was $63. And he was buying, let's say, mm -hmm. around $30 uh, per share. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, embedded value in that from like a protection standpoint. Uh, but what about the income statement and cash flow? But Dillard's also makes money and has cash flow. This is where the upside of the investment comes from. And we were just talking about this, right? If you buy a low P stock or a net net or whatever, and then they start to be rated like a real business, well, that's where you could make multiples on your investment. Uh, Dillard's has cash flowed from operations every year in the last 10 years, including during the pandemic, and their operating cash flow minus their capital expenditures, so free cash flow, has ranged from $400 million to $200 million in recent years. They make money at what they do, and they seem to produce free cash flow. They also seem to have a culture of buying back stock, buying back more than $100 million a year, and sometimes much more in each of the last 10 years. Um, and he goes, uh, putting it all together. He didn't think this was just a heads. I win tails. I lose, but this is more like heads. I win huge because the real estate net of the debt uh, is undervalued currently. And they're likely going to stay in business and that free cash flow has to be valued at something and tails. I don't lose at all because the real estate net of debt that I'm buying is worth more than the purchase price. The upside was huge. And the more importantly, the downside was limited to almost nothing. And it was clearly defined and knowable. What a home run investment. Um, so if he bought it at 35 
or $30 a share, which whatever he said was a $600 million market cap ish. And they were doing around, let's call it, I don't know, hundred to 300 million in free cash flow. If you put a 10 multiple on that, right. Um, you still get a yeah. price that's much higher than what he was buying it at. And then you have all of that real estate value as well. Yeah. It looks like on an enterprise value to free cash flow basis, let's say, it was maybe five to six times. You know, he said they had a half a billion or something in in, in net debt. Mm -hmm. um, so the low one billion, it was valued a little over one billion. Say it's one point two billion or something. Then six times. You know, so if you're taking the debt together, and then you're and then you're just saying that uh, you're counting debt, but you're not counting the real estate. Mm -hmm. So of course you could um, get rid of some of the real estate and instead put it in. Um, uh, and then, you know, you'd have, if you, if your cash flow goes down and stuff, then presumably you wouldn't need the real estate. You could sell that if your business got worse. Um, but of course the timing is the issue here. So there's a few things, right? One is for the most part, if we go back to like, if you look at a chart from like the two thousands or something, um, the, uh, case against it would be one. It hasn't been valued all that much higher. Mm -hmm. Now it, at the very bottom, it actually had been valued a lot higher, not that many years before, but it's often been valued fairly low. Let's put it that way, you know, in the, in the 2010s, um, it's not been a particularly expensive stock. So maybe the bounce back won't be as big Two, at the exact moment you're buying, uh, the belief is that Amazon and those sorts of things mm -hmm. will keep growing. You'll not grow your real estate is believe, you know, in the, among investors, not among the general public and stuff, but among investors, the belief is like, okay, um, the real estate that you have is like worthless because no one's going to be in this business at all in in-person um, real estate, in-person uh, retailing stuff. And uh, with department stores, it's all going to be online. And uh, and so not only is your business being destroyed by that, but the real estate too. I mean, that is the, the risk here is that the real estate and the cash flows are related. And so the stock is probably very cheap when people are negative on um, the entire industry, the entire concept of brick and mortar, big format department store type retail. Yeah. Um, because they're negative on you as a business, but they're also negative on like your locations. I mean, don't you remember the narrative, right? In 2020, hey, all these retailers were actually going to fail over the next 10 years. COVID just sped it up. They're done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, that's now that was saying. not going to happen. Right. Now, that wasn't going to happen in the case of Dillard's. Uh, it, very, very safe. Right. So, one, it owned a lot of the mm -hmm. uh, real estate, like we said, but also had a long history of very positive cash flows, free cash flow, um, which is quite a, a lot different than some of the other re uh, retailers that did fail or came close to failing or whatever. Um, it, it had a lot of uh, free cash flow production over the last 20 years or something. It rarely ever had negative free cash flow, like maybe one or two years. Um, so, and certainly it had operating cash flow all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now part of that is it owns this real estate. If it, had, you know, it owns a lot of real estate. If it had leased everything, then it would be more likely to sometimes go under, mm -hmm. uh, you know, go have negative in a single year. Would you put this in that box of being like a complete no brainer at the time, right? Take the, the result out of it. I mean, who would have guessed though, that the stock would go, I mean, multiples above like what it's, Ever, what it ever traded at uh pre covid i mean yeah that's pretty N pretty surprising no, no one would predict that but you know that does happen with momentum stuff once once a stock gets a lot of momentum that way um obviously it also earned it, it, it the market was completely wrong in that the market thought this would be worse than ever for it and actually it's been better than ever right mm -hmm. okay so do you have any main thoughts on uh the dealer's investment what asymmetry means, finding investments with asymmetric upside. I mean, what comes to mind for me is sort of like the power law, right? Of what, how venture capitalists think about it. You invest a very small amount, perhaps one of them hits on the roulette table. Uh, but is this different because there was real estate value there. If it gets valued on a free cash flow basis, there's still ways you could win there. Really the way that I interpret this now, of course, you got to take out what has happened and what the thoughts were at the time, all the noise around this investment. Um, there were many ways to win, right? And do you think it has actually become way more successful than Ted ever thought it could? 
Oh, I'm sure the stock has been more successful than he thought it could. Yeah, in such a but short period I, of time. Uh, yeah, I've never had a good in. Well, I probably never had a good investment where the stock didn't go up faster than I thought. I've had good investments where the business didn't do as well as I thought, and the stock went up more than I thought. Yeah. So you know, you, you get lucky with those things. Um. Uh. I don't know. I, I think there's some differences with it just being like a um, asymmetric, like we we're talking about, about it having some real safety to it. Mm-hmm. However, so if you think about the business at the time that he was investing in it, um, could it fail? It's a retailer. What would that look like? Yes, it could, but it would happen slowly. It would be like Sears. Um, Sears was always an interesting case that way, but also, you know, JC Penney, um, that's what I was going to say. Is so, like, there a recency would, bias in this, right? You could look at like Sears, Seritage, JCPenney, all these other ones. I mean, the graveyard is well, a mile long of retailers. But they were but they were particularly dumb. They were like aggressively dumb um, in, in that they had to keep doing bad things year after year after year, not change what they were doing and make a lot of bad decisions that way. And if he knew that what management was doing here made a lot more sense, then it would be uh, fine. So yeah, there are ways to to fail, but it, it would be hard to fail quickly. Um, that's always the scary thing about these retail things with Sears or anything else. If Sears was going to operate as a retailer all that time and double down on it and everything, then yeah, it could all your you could lose everything, and and you did eventually in that. Even though there was a lot of value there, um, several of the so. It, you know, but on the other hand, the thing I would compare it to in terms of how it was valued before this was Best Buy, but this wasn't as bad as Best Buy. Uh, Best Buy w- would have required more looking into who was going to turn the company around and stuff and understand it as a turnaround. Um, this didn't require all of that kind of thing. So in a sense, it, it looks like a simpler investment than that, even though it was valued a lot at the same sort of prices. But but it is hard to sometimes tell them apart that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know that the future will be... We don't know what this stock will look like, what this business will look like in 10 years either. Um, I, you probably got lucky in some things in that there's probably a realization... Uh, this is what I mean with like comparing it to Best Buy. That the market was totally wrong. So as it turns out, Dillard's probably doesn't need as much selling space in the future as it did in the past because it could sell a lot online. And and the space that it has is probably has some value that you could get rid of over time too, so it's even better than people thought. And um, and then the things with like the Amazons and all of that turned out that they they've not done that well, you know, versus them since then. So it, it's it's totally reversed, and um, you wouldn't have guessed that like the pandemic would have helped these companies in any way, but it certainly didn't hurt them. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're on trends and stuff where I don't think that we've in any way been pushed to more, uh, of the giant offline, um, uh, giant online companies, uh, being a bigger issue than they were before. So, and that was hard to see at the time in the middle of the pandemic for people. Um, so it, it's weird because in a sense it was already right. It was already like a cheap stock. It was already disliked strongly that category. And then it got even cheaper because of a one-time thing. So it had a long-term stigma attached to it for the better part of a decade. Um, and then it also had this one-time thing happen to it. So, And do you think it was um, too small to do in the portfolio that he manages for Berkshire? Say if he's managing 10 or $20 billion, he made a $30 million bet. Clearly, that's not something he would do. Uh, but it kind of reminds me a lot of you know Buffett's personal account, right? I mean, you just, you're reading all this different information. You're soaking in all this different different information, sometimes you just come across a an idea. Yeah, and sometimes you can identify it at the time and everything. And and that time had a lot of um, ones that had a lot of potential upside. Um, this was extreme in terms of how much it's gone up, right? Yeah. So that's the thing that's remarkable. You we could come up with a bunch of examples of things that have gone up three times or something. We can't come up with a bunch of examples of stocks that have gone up thirteen times. Mm-hmm. Um, what are your thoughts yeah. on like? Again, right? Munger and him, what they communicate, how they preach to investors. I know a certain framework to uh, you know follow for investing. I mean, would you put this Dillard's investment within that framework? Was this something different? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think people hear 
whether they hear what they want to hear or whatever from things where Munger talks about or something, Munger is willing to make very big bets on things that he thinks is, are going to pay off in a big way. And he hasn't always said that that is only in the really good businesses. Now, um, so I think a lot of that is ignored that they've invested in these other things. I mean, if you think about it, what was Munger in? We know some things about what his partnership was in, right? So, like, we know when it wrapped up what it was in. It was in mostly a uh, trading stamps company, which is an investment portfolio. Um, and it was in a, a close-end fund, both very, very cheap versus their um, net asset values. And so they were both trading at way below liquidation value. We know that the biggest bet he ever made in terms of percentage of his portfolio, because he put 100% into it, was, uh, you know, presumably he, he borrowed, mm -hmm. not that he sold everything and went 100% in it, but um, was in a single arbitrage deal with not a huge spread on it and stuff. Um, but one that was almost certain to go through for, for specific reasons, um, that would be hard to imagine it not going through. So there shouldn't have been any spread on it, basically. Um, but so we know about those. And then we also, you know, we, we talked about one in this podcast. So, um, you know, and people forget, that, you know, Buffett wrote up a bunch of things on arbitrage, right? Um, he, I mean, he took the time, the Arcada thing, the, that deal, he, he described that in great detail, the, the whoops bonds, the, um, um, power of bonds with the nuclear power. Um, he went into long description of that if you go back to the past annual report, a uh, past shareholder letter. So like they've talked about some of them. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So I think that those, you know, get overlooked in terms of the other things that they do. What they've said more, they've never said that the way to get rich from a small amount of money is to buy and hold great businesses. They've said the way to invest large sums of money for long periods of time is buying and holding great businesses because you have to keep reinvesting when you have these, um, you know, shorter term, you know, because you have to rotate the portfolio more. Um, and because there aren't great, uh, there aren't as many opportunities in very big things. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, when he was asked, how do you make 50% a year? You know, like put that with Buffett, he said that, you know, he'd go a through Z and very small stocks. And, uh, he didn't say very, the best, very small stocks. Mm -hmm. or something. He said very small stocks, you know? Um, so, and they've told stories like the duck club story yeah. and, you know, so, so they do tell these stories, uh, or, or how about Charlie? What was his biggest mistake ever? Right. His biggest mistake ever, he said, is an oil company. And again, that's a net asset value thing because that is a really good example. Now it went even higher than he could have ever imagined because it became part of a huge, like one of the biggest ever, uh, bidding wars at the time for an oil company, but it was well known that the oil that company controlled was worth way, way, way more than the stock was trading for. Mm -hmm. Like, so in terms of the market value at the time versus the stock, it was already high. And then he benefited from, you know, oil prices went up and then oil companies were willing to pay a lot to take out other oil companies. But everyone agreed that the stock was trading for less than, you know, oil than a controlling stake in it would be. So like he knew when he turned down those extra shares um, that he was which is what he said was his biggest mistake is um, he was turning down something where the, uh, other oil companies would happily buy the whole company for more than he was turning down the, the offer at, you know, the, the um, shares he's being offered at. So same sort of thing. Those are all net asset value type um, bargains. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to find large net asset type value bargains. And yeah. again, we see that problem here. What was the market cap on this at the time that this was available? 600 million, right? Okay. Something like that. Yeah, six hundred million had a tangible book value of eight hundred million, and then he thought the, uh, you know, if you said whether you take the price on the books or the real estate, one point four billion minus the five hundred sixty one million of net debt, you're looking at a tangible book value of yeah eight hundred million. Mm -hmm. So that's um, yeah, I mean on a liquidation basis, I mean we could. Did they say they said it had how much in debt? Do you remember? About five hundred. He says right there five hundred sixty million. In, wait, is that right? Yep, five hundred sixty-one million of net debt. Okay, so let's see. Uh, do you have the exact amount of square feet that they owned? Uh, yeah, forty-three point seven million. 
Okay. So knowing that at the time, now it was probably losing or about to lose money, uh, negative cash flows during actual COVID times, or you would have assumed that it was about to be. Mm -hmm. But putting that aside, you could do an estimate on that basis, which is you can say, okay, well, what is 44 million square feet of that kind of retail space worth? We don't know exactly. Um, it's cheaper to to put out to build out um, something like a department store than it is because there's not a lot to it than it is to like a supermarket or something, which would be the most expensive. But the replacement cost is still very high on that. Um, so you can see how much of that is over the 561 million. So, like for instance, we know that after you're getting more than 10 to 15 dollars per square foot. Mm -hmm. So let's say $15 to be conservative after the first $15 per square foot, the rest of it is going to the equity holders. So you can think the first $15 per square foot is going to the, um, to cover the debt mm -hmm. and stuff. And then the rest is going to, um, the equity holders. And then how much is that? Is it nine times more than that or something? Yeah, it could be sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's probably closer to $150 a square foot than 15. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. So that shows you how much margin of safety there is, yeah. you know. Now, of course, it's even higher now because it's impossible to build. I mean, you know, in the economy that we have now and stuff, like it became very difficult mm -hmm. to to build out any of those things. Um, I mean, t to give an idea, within a year of this, him buying this, it probably cost uh, houses where I live now probably cost 10 times, more than 10 times, 15 times what the market was valuing this company's square footage at to build houses mm -hmm. out here. And this is obviously in desirable locations. It's retail space. It's also highly productive, whatever. So I'm basically saying you couldn't build anything for the kind of price that it was being put out there. Um, so, and inflation helped with that and everything. I mean, if you have an asset thing like this, that helps. Um, and, and then you have the business on top of it. The, there's sort of two ways of looking at it. So one is on the real estate basis, was it worth more than it was trading for? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. So how much more and how well covered is it? It's extremely well covered. We don't know exactly. So like on a liquidation basis, yes, check. It could be liquidated for more than it was trading for. We know that, right? So, um, and then we ask the question of like on an ongoing basis, how cheap was it? So let's say you liquidate and that's your best use of it. And then you just ask the question, is that the best use and would that be what happens? So on a liquidation basis, yes, it would be many times more. Um, I don't know the exact amount, but probably you have a five bagger at least just liquidating it. Um, and then on like a cash flow basis, like we were saying, if you assume that it went back to earning what it was earning before, let's say that was like 200 million or something in like after tax owner earning type cash, you know, um, then you had something that, again, the debt, it, the first three times of that goes to the debt, right? And then you ask, okay, how much goes to other things? Well, if it's trading at, if you said most things, this is going to trade at a lower than most stocks and stuff. Okay, well, maybe I'll trade it 10 times. Then we take, you know, the 10 times we subtract out three times for the debt because 10 times free cash flow debt. Enterprise value is pretty low valuation. Most things are going for more than 50% higher than mm -hmm. that. But you take that out. You say, okay, well, give it to the debt. The first three times is to just, you know, pay off the debt. Three years, basically debt is three years, the free cash flow. And then the, you know, it would be valued. The rest of it would be valued at, what do we say? Let's say 1.4 billion, probably 1.4, 1.5 billion market cap. And what do we say the market cap on this was when he bought in? You said 600? Yeah, 600-ish, yeah. Yeah, so six hundred two to three million. times. Yeah. yeah, so two to three times your money if it's on very cheap on an ongoing basis, mm -hmm. again, saying 10 times enterprise value to free cash flow, And that's, and, and of course the liquidation value is many times that mm -hmm. I would say the liquidation value presumably is double the ongoing. Like we've just valued the company alive at half of what it would be valued dead, but there are costs associated with liquidating something like this. Um, this is so big, right. That the market would have trouble absorbing that much department store space. And in a, recession, depression, whatever people could have been afraid of at the time. Yeah. Um, the easier explanation, of course, is that in the middle of COVID, no one wanted to buy something like Dillard's at any price, Yeah, the stock. Mm -hmm. that it's back the to owners uh, of, panic time, right? When he was just talking about the benefit of purchasing public securities. Sometimes you get the other person across the table. It's just like, take it at any price. 
Right. And so this was happening for two reasons. One, stock reasons, um, that just people wanted out of stocks and didn't want stocks that were, um, you know, not doing well and whatever. But there's also another reason, which is the 1990s bubble reason. Um, and that may explain the Dillard's thing. Not only were people not wanting stocks and trying to get out of that in general at the time, but if they were getting into stocks, they were selling things like Dillard's so they could buy things like Amazon. Mm-hmm. Remember, the, the argument was sell everything offline. They, they Stocks were put into two buckets instead of being like value and growth or something like that. The two buckets were the online and the offline, right? The pandemic winners and the pandemic losers. Those are literally the words people were using is the pandemic winners, pandemic losers, right? And so that was how we divided up the world, you know? Mm-hmm. And of course, it makes no sense because you know that it's a temporary event. It would be like saying winners, you know, winners in a war, you know, the, these stocks will be the winners in this war that's going on right now. These stocks will be the losers in it. Well, we don't know what will happen, what the outcome will be, but we know that it won't continue forever. Right? And if the outcome's and, horrible, well, we're all just screwed anyways, right? So what's... <laughs> yeah. Um, There's your asymmetry but I mean, right we know there. That it, yeah, we, we know that it can't continue indefinitely. Yeah. Um, so, but that was an obsession that people had at the time, obviously. So you have both of those things happening at the same time. So it was even better, even more extreme than like investing in other kinds of stocks. Because um, like I talked about, I, I knew someone who, uh, who you knows the exact time, but like, you know, I, I, that this dealer's investment was made, but somewhere around the same time because March of um, 2020 put a lot of money into frost, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. But that is because... Took out debt that to is do not it as, as well, good. right? Correct, yeah. So... um to kind of go all in there, you know, it didn't matter how much money you have, you borrow or whatever to be able to buy at that price. Um, and that's not as good a deal as Dillard's simply because, uh, people weren't really bailing specifically on banks at that time. So Frost was kind of similar in that it had been cheapish for 10 years, not as hated or something as Dillard's, but it had been cheap for a while because the low, the no interest rate thing. Right. Um, and then it declined. It fell off a cliff on that, as you can see there, um, briefly for like a month or whatever. And then it started going up, but obviously it's not going to go up by some huge amount from there because, uh, it wasn't specifically hated in the same way. I mean, we can look at the, the Dillard's one, but, um, the stock was really not expensive before, which is the interesting thing because of course you could have justifiably, mm-hmm. right? Cause you make money have been in the stock well before the pandemic thought it was a cheap stock Mm -hmm. and you eventually would make a lot of money. But in the meantime, you watch that stock go down a lot. Mm -hmm. Call it from like around 70 bucks to, you know, low of, I mean, he bought it from 25 to 30. So yeah, big amount. Yeah. So you could, you could have had a really cheap stock that dropped more than 50%. Um, but then it went up a lot. Mm -hmm. So you'd still be up five times or whatever in the stock. Um, and that's what happens when you have a really cheap stock. I mean, we looked at the quick FS stuff. It it was pretty cheap year after year, right? Um, certainly it was cheap on like price to earnings and things like that. Um, but there are other, I feel like there are other department stores at times that have been fairly cheap too. Uh, so like we said though, this wouldn't have failed quickly. And I think it would be a judgment about management and their decision making. Mm-hmm. You could get stuck in it for a very long time. You know, so that was basically what the question was, is could this be a value trap? Right. How do you know it wouldn't be a value trap? And I don't know that you don't know that. I think you're a lot of times you invest in things without knowing that it couldn't be a value trap. I don't, that's a weird, you know, but even the, even I don't, the real estate value, that right. Even if you discounted it 50%, the tangible equity was basically what you were paying at a discount. If you're really like implementing even more of a margin of safety. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you think this falls in the bucket of muggers? You get a few opportunities in your lifetime and you have to seize them? Or do you think this that's not the right lesson? Right? Because I'm always trying to, like, what's the correct lesson in real time from the situation? Yes, it's worked out well, right? But hold on. So, like, the Buffett uh, mugger yeah. with, with Alibaba, right? And he talked about how it was the biggest mistake he's ever made, one of them, and how he said he forgot that it was still in his words, like a damn retailer. And he got seduced by the idea of their position in the China market and blah, blah, blah. And when I heard that, I was like, I don't know if that's the right lesson. 
is that it's just a retailer and that's why you know he invested and blah 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 right i was like i don't know if that's the right lesson so what do you think is the right lesson from dillard's obviously it's been tremendously successful um well it's i think it depends on who you are and what you know mm -hmm. so charlie ted probably knew a lot more about dillard's than charlie knew about alibaba um, it's a lot closer to his circle of competence probably than is Alibaba to, um, to, to, to Munger's. There's also things which we talked about in like the quick FS type stuff that's concerning about what was happening with Alibaba when Munger bought in that does not appear with Dillard's. So the actual track record was rapidly deteriorating in a concerning way for Alibaba in a way that is beyond just normally, oh, it's just a retailer, but just that it's incredibly competitive because you have very rapid growth and rapidly uh, declining margins, uh, returns on capital, things like that. That mean the incremental ones are really, really bad. Mm -hmm. So um, it depends on how well he knew the situation, right? Mm -hmm. Um the thing is, there's not a lot of, it's hard if we can look at quick FS to look at this, but there wasn't a ton of evidence in the past record to suggest that you were doing something particularly risky here. There was like no evidence. Um, there was fear that the future would be a lot different than the past. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of fear that this would happen. Um, that it was deteriorating stuff, but this was more a narrative about it mm -hmm. than we can see in the numbers. Cause if we look at the numbers, you know, what was the operating income each year? What was the cash flow each year for many years before this? I'll just, I mean, do you think he expected though? I mean, look at, okay. So 2021 negative 83 million in EBIT, but then 2022 1.1 billion. And they have never done that in their history, at least from 2014 so i'm going to assume in their history maybe you know whatever but ted definitely did not think that would happen no 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 <laughs> definitely not no no i mean if we're look if we're looking at the record of companies and saying do do we think that would happen usually almost always with the really good results where it came out better than you expected yeah. yes but when you asked about the asymmetry thing i said amr price metals i never thought that it could go up by that amount mm -hmm. Um, Quan and I had looked at Encore Wire and we talked about Encore Wire that if there ever got to be a more meaningful spread in terms of like volatility and you know copper and all that and copper got more expensive that they make a lot of money and that people might have been underestimating how much it was poor copper pricing that was contributing to margins to the returns on capital being muted so like they were earning good and then if something big happened they'd earn a lot well we never thought it would go up as much in a single year that they would earn so much Yeah. Um. so that's probably true that you wouldn't expect that. But what I'm saying is like, um, the argument here, here's the thing. We just did two different calculations of conservatively what it would be worth, sure. right? Mm -hmm. Like based on the record from before. So we said like, okay, liquidation value might be five, let's say five times or something what you're paying. So like you're paying 20% of liquidation value or something, 80% of the actual stated book value, maybe something like that. Now there's some leverage in there. So it, it's a little more complicated than that, but um, it's not like your margin of safety is 80%, but your margin of safety is big. It's half or mm -hmm, something. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you have the issue of, uh, the free cash flow that we talked about. So in a sense, you have two defenses, right? If the free cash flow doesn't disappear, the stock is worth two to three times at least what it's trading at. And some people would say it's more like five times. We used a low multiple for that. Okay. So it's several times more valuable. So you have a 50% plus margin of safety on free cash flow. If the free cash flow disappeared and they were willing to liquidate, you have more than a 50% margin of safety in um, liquidation, mm -hmm. right? So that's what I mean about it's not like you took some huge risk that way. Um, Alibaba is very different in that it showed deteriorating financial results mm -hmm. and it was expensive. So yeah, and you this was super cheap and no deterioration yet. But fear deterioration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And look at their diluted shares outstanding. So when you talk about there's really nothing in the past that would have could have scared you in a crazy way, right? They've continuously bought back stock. I always find it interesting though, like, okay, so here we are in 2022 to 2023 on an average, that's 6.8 billion in revenue. But the just the drastic difference in that revenue converting to EBIT or cash flow 
is huge. And it almost like, it's a good lesson for other companies. It's like, this is what can happen. The value creation you can have if you really hone in and, um, you know, whether it was, it was a pricing thing or they cut their expenses or what, there's a drastic difference there in their revenue converting to, you know, EBIT, net income, cash flow, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, some of that is just leverage effects that you have. The That's the issue department stores have, for instance. I mean, uh, it's just a huge amount of real estate that you have no matter what. And then if you sell a lot, it's a lot better business than if you don't. That's why they don't look that great. I mean, they managed to not have operating income in the early 2000s at one point, right? Mm -hmm. So like if you have a bad economic year, you can run into that. Um, there's a lot of leverage in that because you can look at the ratios. The gross um, numbers are good. Um, if we look at like gross profitability or something, you'll see that they're much higher than they are with other retailers that you're used to looking at. Mm -hmm. So like the gross margins here, especially considering what they're selling, they were um, 10 percent or more higher than Walmart, for instance. Mm -hmm. So it's just interesting. Like you look at these numbers, right? You look at SGNA 2018 to 2019, 1.7 billion. And then you look at 2022, 2023, you know, you're kind of uh, 2022, 1.559, 2023, 1.698. Um, but then you look at revenue, which is up a little bit, but how drastically that could affect your earnings. Yeah. Well, the other thing you'll remember from COVID is that we had that was unusual is some companies cut expenses did everything they could to get ready for a drastic decline and instead they had the biggest boom that they'd ever seen so it, if companies knew let's cut as much as we can right ahead of a giant boom yeah your profitability is going to be amazing because normally what you have is more like what you saw with alibaba or something which is when you see a boom you also see a lot of increases in costs and also i mean look what happened to amazon they're less profitable than ever in like every way uh, you know it, they've got more assets earning less in cash and stuff because they went into as did many other tech companies but amazon just a retailer that's tech um they went the opposite way and said oh we have to really this is a big boom and it turned out not to be such a big you know it went away faster so it's not even a question of shrinking and stuff they went to like flat just being about flat and it has a drastic drop off in your results so um this is a company that what for like 10 years or something had been expecting like flat type growth right like in terms of top line mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, They're just buying back your stock, kind of like cannibal, right? Yeah, so um, what's interesting is, let's see. So what was sales in 20, what do you have there, 2014? 6.6 6 billion, or 6.7, we'll, we'll run up. 6.7, 2014, 2019, 6.5. So it's decline. Okay. It decline. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, you know. Um, about that. Now, the interesting thing though was like, um, what have we seen in gross profits, uh, gross margin from 2014 to 2019? Do you have the gross margin? Yeah, there? it went down, uh, 37% 2014, 34% in 2019. Mm -hmm. Which is like what you see in line with some other, um, companies too. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that there's any way that you thought it would have gone up as much as it did, obviously. Mm -hmm. But we did a few different ways of doing the math where it looked cheap. Um, it is now presumably being valued at not such a cheap value, though. Like, what's was 2019 sales, you said, were... 6.5 billion. Uh, so let's say 6.5 billion EV now. Well, I don't know if that calculation is correct, though. Is that calculation correct? I'm not sure if it's correct on the EV and market cap. But let's take market cap plus debt or whatever. Um, we're still at levels that are like one times. Mm -hmm. So not super cheap or anything like that, but actually it's not really valuing much. It's, it's gotten to a value, which is more in line with other companies, but that's about it. Um, because it's free cash flow margin is probably 5% or something in the years before COVID. So basically you're just, if you're valuing it at one times, it's like 20 times free cash flow or something. And like we said, it may have more real estate than it needs or whatever. That's just like in line with the market. Mm -hmm. I mean, it may turn out to be way too expensive because it's a particularly good time for them. And then things are going to get negative 
from here, you know, and their future may not be as bright as other companies and whatever. But you're talking about something that went up more than 10 times, right, the stock. And it's just to what I would say is a fairly normal valuation. I certainly wouldn't call it cheap, but it's not some – usually when we look at things that went up 10 times, we notice that the price to sales is, you know, 14 times Celsius. or something now. Um, yeah. Here we have something where the price to sales is like uh, – price to – Pre-pandemic sales, in fact, that was you know going back and everything, but is is like one times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with Jeff and I on the Focused Compounding Podcast. If this is the first time you are joining us, be sure to check out all of our content on the internet. Go to focusedcompounding.com to get access to investment write-ups from Jeff going all the way back to 2005. And of course, if you're interested in learning more about our money management services, you can reach out to me at andrewredfocuscompounding.com. I thank you so much for all the support, and we'll see you in the next podcast. Take care.